Good morning and praise the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us for service this morning. And thank you so much because you took time to join us. We appreciate you and we love you. And we believe that the Lord has a word for you that will change your life forever today in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember today also doubles our, as our Thanksgiving service for the month of September. As our custom is every month at the, on the last Sunday of the month, we take off uh, some time to thank God and to appreciate him for his good things in that month. Because we believe that our appreciation to God is our application for more. And for that, we are grateful to God for every good thing that he has done for us in the month of September. Take off some time, give him praise, give him glory for every testimony, for every change of story, for every change of level, for every deliverance, for every miracle, for every healing. Give him all the praise, give him all the glory, for he is worthy. Not unto us, O Lord, but unto your name be all the praise, be all the glory, the honor, and the adoration. In Jesus' name we have given thanks. Amen and amen. Thank you once again for joining and thank you for being part of Amazing Grace Faith Church Service coming to you live from Mount Zion Studios. Today we are going to be taking the word of God from Genesis chapter number 8 verse 20 up to 22. And I believe that you are going to be blessed. Remember we've been looking at a teaching series, Open Heaven, and we have been looking at, very, at various principles and various virtues that once engaged in the lives of believers will open the heavens over their lives. And the Spirit of God reserved this one for you today because, yes, it is very, very important and you need to get this one. And once you get it very well, your heavens shall be perpetually open in the name of Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 8, verse number 20, this is what the Bible says. It says that then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And then it says, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I wonder how Noah heard it, <laughs> or the writer. And then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again cast the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Noah did something, and what he did provoked God to release a certain proclamation of I will never do this. In verse 22, this is what the Spirit of God says, and this is what God said. He says, while the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. God echoed a law that he had set from the beginning, and now he, re, I mean, he re-echoes it and now puts it for us in the pages of the Bible. Yes, it has been there. It had been there even in Genesis chapter 1 when he created plants. And he said that in every plant that bears seed, he gave to man for his food. And every creature that he created, he gave it the ability to reproduce. Meaning he had already set that law in motion. But in Genesis chapter 8 verse 22, he brings it, I, I mean, he puts it for us there now in the pages of the Bible as a remembrance. And now I want you to see, he says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall never cease. What are we going to be looking at today? We are going to be looking at the giving gateway to open heavens. The giving gateway to have open heavens. The giving gateway to open heavens. Understanding giving as a gateway to open heavens. You know, you can talk about, like we talked about obedience, we talked about obedience to the voice of God, we talked about prayer, we talked about the angelic, we talked about the virtues that provoke open heavens. But if we did not talk about the giving gateway to open heavens, I can assure you we'll be robbing ourselves of a very powerful virtue as far as open heavens are concerned. You need to understand this. 
that there are few, okay, even the things we talked about, you, you will not find them so directly linked to open, as directly linked to heaven, to open heavens as actually giving and prayer. In fact, the mystery of prayer and the mystery of giving are the two mysteries that are directly linked to open heaven. What I mean by that is that God says it in his word, in, I mean, in a way that you don't have to connect two scriptures to arrive at it. No, in just one sentence. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, 15, he says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. In other words, prayer gets us directly in touch with the heaven, and prayer opens the heaven directly. In other words, the moment a Christian begins to pray, heaven must give attention to your prayers. Let's look at Revelation chapter 5, verse number 8. It shows us that now when he had taken the scroll, talking about Jesus, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden balls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints are in heaven and they are what? In golden balls. They are there. God keeps them there and God answers them from there. Now listen, also read Revelation chapter 8, verse number 9. I mean, verse number 3, Revelation 8, verse 3. You're also going to see there that then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Meaning the prayers are there in heaven. Angels have to, I mean, to offer them to God and they have to mix incense in them so that God can receive them with gladness. Now we can see there that prayer connects us directly with heaven. Prayer opens the heaven. Prayer is directly linked to heaven. The other mystery that we see linked to heaven directly, to open heavens directly, is the mystery of giving, particularly the mystery of tithing. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 10, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven, if I will not open the windows of heaven, so he says that if you bring the tithe, the windows of heaven are going to be open. So we see there the tithe and giving directly connected to open heaven. We also have already seen in the book of, uh, of Genesis, chapter 8, verse 22, that when God smelled an aroma from Noah's sacrifice, he made a decree, I will never cast the earth again for man's sake. He smelled something as an offering from Noah, and he released a blessing, and he decreed that he will never cast the earth again. Let me tell you, child of God, open heaven's answer to giving. Open heaven's answer to die. Open heaven's answer to the law of seed time and harvest. And I know that many people, every time you hear such kind of a word like seed time and harvest, the moment you hear that, immediately your mind runs to money and your mind, run, your mind runs to finances and you think, oh, now they're talking about money. Yes, we are talking about money and we are talking about finances, but this is a law that exceeds and goes beyond money and finances. As you know that the great things in life are not money. The great things in life are not actually, are not actually a physical substance. The great things in life are peace, joy, love, kindness, temperance, the things of the spirit, the virtues on the inside that cannot be money. I mean, they cannot put, that you can't put a price on, that you cannot purchase with money. And I want to assure you that when the Bible says that seed time and harvest shall not cease, it is not limited to money. It is It, it incorporates everything that you will ever desire in your life. What is it that you lack in your life? What is it that you seek to have in abundance? What 
What is it that you seek to increase in as far as your life is concerned? Is it grace? Is it favor? Is it joy? Is it peace? Is it love? What do you want to see coming to you in multiplied form? What they, I have good news for you today. Whatever you would like to see in your life in multiplied form from heaven, get ready to receive a principle that is going to bring it to you cheaply and effortlessly in the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Everything you can ever have in your life as a harvest, you can also sow as a seed. Shout glory. Everything you can have in your life as a harvest, you can also sow in your life as a seed. As a matter of fact, you want love, sow love. You want, you want peace, give people peace. You want, you want what, what is it that you want? You want favor, show people favor. You want mercy, be merciful to people. You want kindness, be kind to people. This is the law that God set in motion in the book of Genesis chapter 8, 22. He reminded us, and it is there eternally, that anything you ever desire in life, be sure that once you put yourself in a position where you can release that thing into the life of someone, that thing will come back to you from heaven in the name of Jesus. Listen, you don't have to complain about your deficit. You don't have to complain about what you lack. You don't have to complain about what you don't have. All you need to understand is this, that whatever I may not have in abundance, all I need to do is make sure that I give it. If I have little of it, I have to release it. If I have something about the thing I desire that is not uh, to the extent that I desire, that is not to the magnitude I desire, how it increases is that I must release it, is that I must give it. That is the law that God uses when he wants something. We see it in John chapter 3, verse number 16 which is the, the scripture that everyone should know and everyone should have read before or you have heard. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What does that mean? That God had one son in creation, as in he found himself in eternity with one son, Jesus Christ, but he wanted to have many sons. He he wanted to have multiple sons. He, wants to ha he wanted to have me and you and all the saints that have come to the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. And what did he do? He did not go and create more. Yes, he created Adam, but that is not enough to make Adam his son. He gave him a choice to eat from the tree of life, to believe in his son and become also a son of God. That is what happened in, Gen I mean, in John chapter 3, verse 16. That's what Jesus meant. He said, when God wanted many sons, he went and sowed his son. He gave his son to the world. And because God was willing to release his son, now he has multiple sons, multitudes, millions from all over the world. Those that have gone ahead of us and those that are coming, everyone that will ever believe in Jesus Christ is a harvest that God got, that God is going to get for giving his son into the world. Now, that is not just for God. That is for all of us. What is it that you desire, child of God? What is it that you want to have in abundance? Well, position yourself to release that thing out of you. The measure that you have, it may be a seed like a mustard seed. Whatever you have in the measure that you desire, I mean, of that thing that you desire, prepare yourself to release that continually. Why? Because as you release it, you provoke the law of seed time and harvest, and that very thing shall be coming to you in the name of Jesus Christ. That is very, very powerful. It is important for us, a children of God, to know that a combination of prayer and giving makes a Christian absolutely indestructible. A combination of prayer and giving makes a Christian absolutely indestructible. It attracts the attention of heaven. Let's look at a man called Cornelius in the Bible in Acts chapter 10, verse number 1. This is a man that balanced these two virtues uh, properly, and he was a very unique man in his generation. He says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. 
And then he says, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. And prayed to God always. He gave too much and he prayed too much. He gave too much and he prayed too much. And listen to verse 3. He says that, and about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your arms, your prayers and your giving, your prayers and your giving have come up to God for a memorial. Your prayers and your giving have come up to God for what? For a memorial. Cornelius combined the two greatest virtues that a man can ever have. He was a great prayer and he was a great giver. I, I, I discovered this very many, uh, many years ago. By many, actually, I mean about uh, at least 10, 15, maybe 10, 12 years ago, uh, that the, the, there was always this kind, there was always a kind of thinking. And actually, it wasn't a kind of thinking. It was the truth. It was the fact. Okay, it was a fact that a lot of people that prayed too much were actually always struggling financially. And then you found that some people who had means financially were always struggling in prayer because they felt like they had it all. Then I realized that if a man combines these two, that man becomes indestructible. It's not enough for a child of God to be prayerful. It is, it is important for a child of God to be giveful, <laughs> to, to be generous. And it's not, a, it's not enough for a child of God to just be generous without prayer. It is good for you to be generous and prayerful. Are you listening, somebody? That is very important. But our focus uh, this morning, our focus this morning is not going to be on prayer. It's going to be on giving because we have given uh, prayer that kind of attention that actually I believe for now we can say we can comfortably talk about giving. Let's look at this giving grace. Let's look at this giving gateway to open heavens. Very, very important for you as a child of God to understand that there are certain blessings that are retained or they are reserved for givers. There are certain aspects of open heavens that you cannot tap into until you enlist as a sower, until you enlist as one that understands and practices the law of sowing and what? And reaping. Remember this, child of God, that God governs the entire universe through laws. God governs the entire universe through laws. Laws are what God uses to govern the universe. Many of you must have uh, wondered. I, I remember one time I listened, I mean, you, you, I listened to a song uh, that, that seemed to ask, how does God manage to put everything together? People are asking for all manner of things. Uh, someone is asking for this, the other one is asking for the opposite. Now, how does God, and you've seen movies, including the one of, uh, I think, Jim Carrey, that, that have tried to, to like, to, to to, to mimic or to, 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 to mock how it is, like how hard it is for God to govern the universe. But I want to tell you, it is so easy for God to govern the universe because actually he does it through the laws he has set in motion. For example, he made the earth and he decided the earth is the jurisdiction of mankind, of man. And he put us here and he did not have to, to, I mean, to send angels to keep us here. He doesn't have to send angels, I mean, to hold us here on earth and to stop us from coming to where he is. No, he just set a law in motion called the law of gravity. And so you jump, you come down, you go up, you come down. I, I, I love the Luganda saying about that. I mean, you go up whether, whether it's, a, it's, a, it's an ego, <laughs> whether, it's a, whether you're an ego, whether you're what kind of bird, whether, whether you, could, you could go in the air, you could soar, you could be out there, but one day you still have to come down, especially when you have to eat, you come down. You can fly in the plane, but you come down. You, you see why? Because God has put the earth as the jurisdiction of man, according to Psalms 115 verse 16. 
the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. But how does he contain the sons of men on the earth? Because they like exploring, they like leaving their territory. He has put the law of gravity. And even those that try to venture into space, he has put laws that will keep them. The moment they exceed certain boundaries, they will not be seen forever. Why? Because God has put laws with which he governs the what? The earth. What is a law? A law is this. It is a fact that something happens, I mean, uh, that something always turns out a certain way as long as certain conditions are present. It's, uh, it, it is, uh, I, okay, the, 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 the dictionary definition is quite difficult. I try to break it down into like what you call a layman's language. What is the law? When we talk about the law of gravity, when we talk about the law of the tithe, when you talk about the law of um, Newton's laws of motion, what is the law? It is, it is that phenomenon. It is that existence. It is the fact that something always happens a certain way as long as certain conditions are present. For example, if you jump, you come down. Whether you're big, whether you're tall, whether you're short, whether you're dead, whether you're alive, you, as long as there's nothing to support you, you will always come down. That's a what? That's a law. That's a law. We have seen in life there's a law of gravity. And then we have also seen, I remember when we were in school, we studied about Newton's laws of motion, which I like so much. But I like mostly the third one, which is that an object... <laughs> <laughs> that an object assumes a state of rest until a relevant force is what is applied. An object assumes a state of rest until a relevant force is what is applied. That is a law. In other words, if there's no force exerted on an object, that object will never live where it is. Are you understanding somebody? If there's no relevant force exerted on an object, that object will always be in a state of rest. When I was doing my study, I was reminded also of uh, the Arch Archimedes law, which is actually Archimedes principle, which uh, I used to like so much when I think I was in senior too. Uh, it, it says that when an object is partially or fully submerged in a fluid, the force acting on it is equal to the, I mean, to the weight of the of the fluid it has displaced. Are you understand? Did you understand that? That when an object is fully or partially submerged in a fluid, the force that is acting on it upwards is equal to the weight of the fluid it has di displaced. In other words, if it has displaced 30 liters, then that is exactly the force that is working on it. I, do you understand? And I like the law of flotation, which was uh, that a floating object uh, or a submerged object displaces water equal to its own volume. And some of you, uh, you sit there and you wonder, why did I even have to study such kind of things? And why is the apostle, um, I mean, even mentioning such things is reminding me or, or, or things that used to give me headache. Let me tell you something. Those principles, those laws are behind a lot of things that are beneficial to us today. For example, without the understanding of Newton's laws of motion, we wouldn't have cars, we wouldn't have vehicles, we wouldn't have uh, border borders, we wouldn't have bicycles, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have cars, we wouldn't have planes, we wouldn't have why? Because every moving object somewhere somehow is using or exerting or somehow operating within Newton's laws of motion, the discovery of those laws. And talk about Archimedes principle. When we're in school, they showed us uh, they get a sponge or a brick, they submerge it in water, and you wonder how would that be, how would that, way, how would that be helpful? How would it ever be helpful in my life? And how, like, like, how would that help? If you're here, like where we are, it may not help you, uh, except from swimming. But if you go to developed nations that have submarines and they have big ships on the waters, they are floating, they are, uh, they are down there. And what are they using? They are using all these laws. They are using the law of flotation. They are using Archimedes principle. And that's why they are doing exploits. Their laws are, are not venture into the law of aerodynamics. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will not go uh, there. I have friends that know that uh, so much. But I know I will, uh, this is it. That the planes go in the air also using certain laws. Laws that they did not create. No, they were just discovered. They were just discovered. So laws are not made by man. No, man discovers laws and man uses those laws to his advantage. Man discovers laws and man uses those laws he has discovered 
to his advantage. Now, the law of seed time and harvest is a law just like the law of gravity. You know, some people, when they hear uh, seed time and harvest, they think of law of Moses. No, we're not talking about the law of Moses. We are talking about law, as in that something always happens a certain way as long as certain conditions are constant. So the law of seed time and harvest is a law just like gravity is a law, just like aerodynamics is a law, just like um, uh, Newton's laws are laws. That's it. It is, the, it, and this is how uh, this is how you define the law of seed time and harvest. Number one, it is a law that I mean, it, it is the same law called the law of giving and receiving. But it simply can be said as this: that whatever you give will come back to you. It's as simple as that. Whatever you give will come back to you. It's a law. It's a law. You say, but apostle, I give and I didn't receive. No. It's like saying that, apostle, I jumped and I didn't fall down. Listen, if you jump, you fall down. If you give, you will receive. And you say, but apostle, I remember I didn't receive. You received all you're going to receive. But it's a law, just like the law of gravity. Once you begin to approach the Bible with this kind of understanding, the devil will never deceive you that your tithe is not working. The devil will never deceive you that your giving is not working. The devil will never deceive you. That how come I gave and I didn't get? No, I didn't receive. Why? Because just like, the, I mean, he says, as long as the earth remains. In other words, if you look up and the earth is still there, he said seed time and harvest. Then he said cold and heat. Is there cold and heat? Yes. And then he says winter and summer. Is there winter and summer? Yes. Then he says a day and night. Is there day and night? Yes. If there's day and night, if there's winter and summer, if there's cold and heat, then there is seed time and what? And harvest. I can assure you. What is seed time and harvest? What is that law? What does it say? How does it operate? It is seed Simple. Whatever you give, you will receive. It is as simple as that. Whatever you give, you receive. Is it, there is no, have you seen people questioning the law of gravity? They like, uh, no. Have you seen people questioning Newton's laws of motion? No. Have you seen people questioning Archimedes' principle? No. Why? Because they were proven by scientists. But you see, there are certain laws that God has hidden from scientists and he has revealed them <laughs> mysteriously through his apostles and prophets. Are you listening to somebody? And once you tap into them, you'll be living above science and you'll be living above the limitations of men. Tithe is the law, just like you see the law of gravity. Look at this. The, the, the fact that it's the law, in fact, there are people, ungodly people, that have tapped into the laws of God, the laws of the Spirit, and they have, I mean, they have stumbled upon them, or some of them have gotten them by revelation from the devil, and they have used them to achieve evil goals. And they have used them to do certain things to you. Act, using the same laws that God set in motion to actually bless you. But the non-believers, the children of, I mean, of darkness, have stumbled on these laws and they are using them against children of God who are so seemingly, uh, I mean, uh, in the spirit that they cannot see that, yes, you need to be in the spirit, you need to pray, but you also need to discover certain laws, certain secrets, certain mysteries that will give you the edge over the inhabitants of the earth. Are you listening to somebody? Let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. This is what Jesus himself said. Now he echoes it, and he's almost saying the same thing that God said in Genesis chapter number 8, verse 38. You know, many people want to know, why do pastors talk about giving? Jesus talked about giving, so we have to talk about giving. God talked about giving, so we have to talk about giving. God told, Jesus talked about, I mean, giving and receiving, so you need to hear it. Why? Because that thing in you, that, that thought in you, that feeling in you, that detests giving with a passion is nothing other than the spirit of poverty. It is fueled uh, by the spirit of poverty that wants to keep you in the same position forever and wants to hammer you and grind you forever. But once you begin to say, no, I need to hear this just like I've heard any other message. I need to enjoy this just like I enjoy any other message. Then you are ready to break the bounds of poverty and walk into abundance in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, have, them, have there people People, are there people who have abused this? Yes. And they, we also know that there are many things that have been abused, but we still use them, but we still study them, and we still go to find out the depth of them. Why? Because you can't cast out the baby with the bathwater. Are you listening to somebody? Luke chapter 3, I mean chapter 6, 38, this is what Jesus said. Give, and it shall be given back to you. 
Then it says, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men pour into your bosom. Then it said, for with the measure, with the same measure that you use, it shall be measured unto you. Listen, give, and it shall be given back to you. Many of you, uh, my daughters, many of you girls, ladies, are looking for love. You're looking for love. You're looking for real love. You're looking for, for sincere love. You're looking for real love. You're tired of fake people. You're tired of fakeness. You're looking for love. Let me tell you something. Give it. Give it, give it, invest it somewhere. You say, Apostle, where? Invest love somewhere. Invest love somewhere. Invest love in people that you, you probably don't want to love you back. Invest love in people that, uh, that will never pay you back. Invest love in people that are not even your kind. And see that love come back to you in multiplied form the way you want it. Many people say, I want a peace of mind, but they are always quarreling. And they say they want a peace of mind. Listen, you want a peace of mind? So peace. You want a peace of mind? So peace. Be a peacemaker. Let's look at again the second definition of the law of seed time and harvest. What does it say? Whatever you sow, you do what? You reap. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 6. Whatever you sow, you reap. And I can say boldly, I mean uh, verse 5, Galatians 6, verse 5. I can say boldly that you don't have, let me tell you, don't limit this teaching uh, to what? To, 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 don't limit this teaching to what? To, to, to giving money and all. No. Look at every aspect of your life. Let's move to verse 7, then. Galatians uh, chapter 6, verse number 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. I mean, how clear can the Bible be? Like, how open can someone be as far as the scriptures are concerned? Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he will also reap. And now he shows us it's not just about money. Verse number 8, he says, if he, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he who sows in the spirit will of the spirit reap what? Everlasting life. In other words, if you invest in fleshly ventures, you're going to harvest a lot of fleshly results. If you invest in what? In things of the spirit and of righteousness, you're going to reap righteousness. I have seen people say, well, I don't know if I can overcome this habit or if I can break this habit. It has been the easiest thing for me to help people overcome destructive habits. How? Just change your environment. Change your exposure. Change what you're exposed to. Change your environment. Change what you listen to. Change what you see. Change who you talk to. And you can be anything that you want to be. Why? Because whoever you give your ears, you have given them influence over your life. Whoever you give your eyes, you have given them influence over your life. Whatever you expose yourself to, you have said, sow this seed into my life. Listen, a harvest will come out. And I decree in the name of Jesus, by this revelation, you shall be sowing good seed and you shall be reaping a good harvest. Every bad seed that you have sowed, either knowingly or unknowingly, I command it uprooted and destroyed in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Let's look a little more in the law of seed time and harvest. What is it? It is that whatever you do to others, you will reap somehow. Whatever you do to others, it will be done to you. In fact, in the world, it's called karma. And, and, and I, I don't like using that word, but it's called karma. And you see people say, oh, karma got them. Oh, this, this is karma, karma, this, karma, that. But this is the law of seed time and harvest. It's not karma. This is the law of seed time and, what, and harvest. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verse number, number 1. Matthew 7, verse 1. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Verse 3. What does it say? And why do you look at a speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Verse 4. And then it says, and how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look not at the plank in your own eye. But it begins by saying, judge not that you may be what? Judge. In another translation, it says, condemn not that you may be what? No, condemn. So listen. If you so, if all your reaping is criticism, if you, all your reaping is condemnation, if you, all your reaping is judgment, 
Look at what you have been sowing. Look at what you have been giving. Why? Because in life, you're not permitted to harvest something you have not sowed. This is very, it's, it's, it's some bitter truth. But uh, I, that is, uh, myself that is speaking to you, I'm not perfect. There are some, there's some uh, area, I mean, areas in my life that I still want to see more and more of the glory of God. And, and, and I must say that I, I have to face it square and say, whatever I see in my life that is undesirable, it must be a harvest of something I've sowed. That is the truth. That is the bitter truth. So if you don't like your harvest, change the seed now. Change the seed now. Because what you're having today is a harvest of what you sowed yesterday. And yet you say, but Apostle, no, 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 no. I was never part of this. Someone is responsible. My father, my grandfather, my, my, my stepmother, so-and-so was never there. So-and-so was never there. I, I want to tell you that God has told us in his word that whatever people have done to you is not what has made you how you are, the way you are. It is what you have done to yourself, either responding to what they did or responding to what they did not do. You sowed a certain seed, and that's exactly what you have. I was worried about, uh, how about the little children that will find themselves in undesirable situations and circumstances. That's why I will tell you, once you see them in the bosom of the Father, or if you see them in the image of God, you will know very well that they are taken care of. Why? Because those ones you can say boldly and you can say honestly that they are victims of situations and circumstances that have come upon them because of the seeds of other people, because of the seed of the bad seeds of other people. So the, the, the misfortune or, or, or the undesirable circumstances has come on a different person. But as long as, I mean, when you begin to hit maturity, when you begin to hit uh, a consent, when you begin to grow as a man, I'm speaking to us as men, as women, mature, you can no longer blame what they did to you or what they did not do to you. No. Now, at a certain point in your life, your life becomes a product of your seeds of yesterday. And therefore, if you want to change what you're seeing today, I mean, what you're seeing today and you don't want to see tomorrow, you, you, you better start sowing different seeds today. You better take this teaching serious and do not limit it at all to finances. No, take it to every area of your life that you desire to see goodness, that you desire to see a blessing, that you desire to see the glory of God and begin to release that and begin to release it joyfully into the lives of other people and then you will see it come back to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. What is the law of seed time and harvest? It is that whatever you do for others, it will return to you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 7. Whatever you do to others will return to you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. In other words, you want mercy? Be merciful. If you squeeze people to the bone, don't be shocked when you're squeezed to the bone. If you don't show people mercy, don't be shocked when you don't receive what mercy. Whatever you want generally in life, be sure to give that in abundance in the name of Jesus. Now, this law of sowing and reaping is so important that it literally is the law that was the, that was the governing law in the life of Jesus Christ and in his redemption for us. Look at John chapter 12, verse 24. And see what Jesus said about himself. He said, most assuredly I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Listen, this is Jesus speaking of himself. And he says, unless he dies, he will be the only begotten of the Father. But the moment he dies, he will become the first begotten of the Father. Do you understand that? Before he died, he was the only begotten of the Father. After he died, he becomes the first begotten. Why? Whether there's a first, there's a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a, and a tenth, and a zillion, everyone that will ever come is, uh, is what is coming because Jesus chose to die that he may become the first word begotten. He sowed himself as a seed into the earth, and then he was resurrected in multiplied form as many sons. And it doesn't matter what people do, wicked men, what they do to the church of Jesus Christ, whatever men plan, governments, presidents, kings, UN, whatever you plan against the church of Jesus Christ is total, is total, it's a total joke. You cannot kick against the pricks. You can't kick against the gods. On this rock, Jesus said he will build his church 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You cannot stop the church of Jesus Christ by any means whatsoever. Why? Because it was, it, it is a harvest of the seed that Jesus sowed of his, himself into the ground. And then uh, if you try to stop the, such kind of a harvest, that harvest is likely to crush you in the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 4, verse number 1 to 2, uh, we see Jesus speaking and he talks about the parable of the sower. And he talks about the parable of the giver. I mean the sower. I said the sower went out to sow. Some seed fell on good ground. And uh, I, want to, I don't want to read all of it, but I want us to look at uh, verse 10. Verse 10, the disciples of Jesus asked him, why, what does this parable mean? But see what Jesus told his disciples in Mark chapter 4, verse number 10. He said, they asked him, Mark 4, 10, he says, but when he was alone, those around with him and the 12 asked him about the parable. Now look at verse 13. Uh, jump and go to verse 13. He says, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable of the sower? How then will you ever understand all the parables. Meaning, if you don't understand the parable of sowing, if you don't understand the parable of the sower, you will never understand any other parable. It's like you are saying, if you don't understand giving and receiving, if you don't understand sowing and reaping, you can't understand anything in the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's exactly how it operates. That's how, exactly how the kingdom of, of God operates. That is how multiplication comes. That is how things are increased in the name of Jesus Christ. I remember when we were in primary school, we studied about rainfall. And we talked about three types of rainfall. There's conventional, there's relief, and I think there's a, there's a third one. Uh, I, I, I forgot it. But I remember conventional rainfall. It is the one that we receive here in the tropics. The, I mean, there's too much uh, the heat comes into the forest or into the water body, and as the heat comes, the vapor rises, and as the vapor rises, the, uh, the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. It cools up there, and then it comes down as what? As rain. That's exactly how the principle of seed time and harvest works. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number 1, and then we'll see more about this uh, before I conclude. Here's what it says. It says, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. He says, give a portion. Verse 2, hurry up. He said, give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you don't know, you don't know what evil will be upon the earth. And, but he said, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. Child of God, don't be, don't be weary because you have sowed and you haven't seen a harvest. Don't be tired because you have given and you haven't seen. No, if the clouds be full, they will empty themselves. Don't be, there you'll be like, you, you, you have to understand the law, the, the law, I mean, of conventional rainfall. As the, as the mist rises, and it reaches up there, it begins to cool down. And at a certain point, the clouds become so heavy, they have to let down. And that is what has happened to you, child of God. Every seed you have sowed of kindness, every seed you have sowed of love, every seed you have sown of... Um, of joy into other people's lives. Every, every seed of finances that you have sown in any ministry, everything you have given as out of you. Let me tell you something. It is going up in a certain cloud in the heavens. And once you are faithful and consistent, one of these days your, your cloud is going to be full. And when your cloud is full, it's going to empty itself upon your life. So you can see this, that when you understand the law of seed time and harvest, it is easy for you to provoke open heavens. Why? Because as so I, I, whenever I realize that I've not yet seen my harvest, all I have to do is keep what? Keep the mist going up. Is keep the mist going up. Is keep the mist going up. Keep the vapor going up. Keep the aroma going up. Keep the sacrifice coming up. It may be, like I said, it may be resources. It may be love. It may be prayer. It may be service. It may be time. It may be your time. Your, everything you have to give. Keep on adding. Why? Because every time you give, you're filling up your cloud in the heavens. You're filling up your cloud. And when the clouds are full, and I see somebody's cloud full, and I decree the rain is coming, I hear the sound of abundance of rain in your finances, in your relationships, at your workplace, in your career, in the name of Jesus Christ. So it's important for us to also know these facts about seed. And I'm going to run through them as I conclude. The first is that your current level is a product of your seeds of yesterday. 
the, your current level is, your, is a product of your seeds of yesterday. In yesterday, I don't mean the day after. Uh, I, I mean, I don't mean yesterday, Saturday. No, I mean yesterday. Uh, I mean your yesterday, your, your, your past. Your current level is a harvest of the seeds you have sown in your past. And your future is going to be a harvest of the seeds you're sowing today. Listen. When you sow seeds of complaining and murmuring, you receive them in the future. When you sow seeds of thanksgiving today, even when there's nothing to thank God for, you receive them in the future with a reason, more than one reason to thank God for. So your future is going to be a harvest of the seeds you're sowing today. Be careful what you do with your mouth. Mark chapter Number four, verse number 11, it makes it clear also that the seed, Mark 4, um, to you it has been given to know. Okay, let's go back to verse 10. Verse 10, it says, if you don't understand, the, when you are, those around you ask him, the 12, about the parable, verse 11, what does it say? He said, if you don't understand this parable, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom, but to those who are without, uh, these things come in parables. Let's look at verse 14, verse 14, verse 14. 14, verse 14. This is what the Bible says. It says, the sower sows the word. The sower sows what? The word. So the word is the greatest seed. The word is the greatest seed. So you are where you are today because of the seeds you have sown yesterday. The words you spoke yesterday. The way you gave yesterday. The things, the love you gave yesterday. The mercy you gave yesterday. The kindness you gave yesterday is what you're harvesting today. It's what you're harvesting today. Don't run away from your harvest. No, face it. Face it. Go in the mirror and say, oh my God, look at the person in the mirror and tell him, how could you have sown such kind of seeds? And after you have done that, speak to the person in the mirror and tell him you better sow better seeds for tomorrow. Speak words of faith. Speak words of power. Speak words of courage. Speak words of favor. Speak bold words and see that your future is secured. You see, yeah, uh, someone said, you can never buy uh, yesterday, but if you hustle hard, tomorrow can be yours. I think I love that. I don't know who said it, I, but I quote. He said, you can never buy yesterday, but if you, has, if you hustle hard, tomorrow can be yours. If you work hard, tomorrow can be yours. Let's look at another fact about seed. It says the proportion of your seed directly affects the size of your harvest. The proportion of your seed directly affects the size of your harvest. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Number four fact about seed, there is always a seed in every harvest that guarantees another harvest. Every harvest you receive has a seed in it. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 10, it tells us, He that gives seed to the sower and bread for food. So every harvest you receive has a seed in it, and it has your food in there. For every harvest you receive, there is bread for you to eat and there is seed for you to sow that guarantees another harvest in your future. And last fact about seed is that if you become consistent in your sowing, you'll be ushered into a season of endless harvest. Did you know that? If you become consistent in your sowing, you will soon be ushered into a season of endless harvest. Some people know that the salary is coming at the end of the month, and that's when they tithe. And if you do that consistently, you will always receive your salary at the end of the month. But when you want to receive weekly, you begin to do things that are out of the ordinary. When you want to receive daily, you begin to do things that are out of the ordinary. But I can assure you, the moment you become consistent in your sowing, you will be ushered into realms of endless harvest. Amos chapter 9, verse 13. Is very clear. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the trader of grapes, he that sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. What it means that a time can come in your life when, when, when while you're still harvesting, another harvest comes in. And where you're still sowing, another harvest is coming in. In other words, you become a, a man of harvest in season and out of season. Why? Because you're sowing in season and out of season. Let's look at the blessedness of the giving covenant. What is blessing is in giving, what opens our heavens. Number one, giving op guarantees open heaven. G giving guarantees open heaven. 
Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Very clear. He says, bring you all the tithe into my storehouse and prove me now if I will not open the windows of heaven. Giving guarantees open heaven. In this COVID season, some of us know that if it wasn't for the fact that we stayed faithful, we remained faithful to the covenant of giving, we don't know where we would be. We don't know where we would have gone, what we would have been doing. But we have been sustained, we have been provided for because even in the midst of the lockdown, people never failed and people never stopped continuing to do what they're supposed to and that's why they are blessed and that's why they I'm speaking to the most blessed congregation that I know why because you understand the law of seed time and harvest and this comes to you as a reminder and if you're hearing it for the first time be part of this joy be part of this excitement be part of these breakthroughs why because giving guarantees open heavens I know people in a mist that in the midst of lockdown they finished their houses and they even entered their houses in the midst of lockdown. I know people in the midst that actually in this lockdown, they have never received the kind of bonuses they have received at their workplace. I know some whose salaries have been doubled. I know many who have been promoted and many who have increased mightily through what? Through the law of seed time and harvest. Number two, the devourer is rebuked by your giving. Do you know you get money and before you know it, your child is sick and the money required to treat your child is exactly the increase you had received? You know you get money and then your phone is stolen and the money you need to restore the phone is exactly what was what you have just received you receive money and a problem uh, comes and the, exactly what you received is what is required to solve the problem that is the devourer that is a monitoring spirit but when you are a tither that devourer that monitoring spirit is rebuked in the name of Jesus Christ and lastly but not least uh, curses are averted when you give Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 God saw the sacrifice, he received the sacrifice of Noah, and he said, no more will I ever cast the earth because of man. I will never, why? Because of the seed that a man sowed after he had come out of what? Out of that flood. What are we to give? Number one, we are to give ourselves. Ourselves. Yes. Before you give joy, give yourself. Give yourself. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 5. It talks about these people, the Corinthians. The Bible says that, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord. Many of you have been told that if you tithe, even if you don't change your life, you go to heaven. That's a lie. Don't go to hell. Don't, uh, it, there's no amount of, the, of money that can buy your place in heaven apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't deceive yourself. The seed for salvation is your heart. You must give your heart to Jesus Christ. There's no other way. You can tithe even, and even give everything you have. You will not purchase your salvation until you have given your life to Jesus Christ. Are you listening, somebody? So don't fall for such kind of teaching, such kind of messages. Number one, give your heart. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26. My son, give me your heart and let your, ears, let your eyes observe my ways. My son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. That's the first thing you give to God. That's the first thing that God wants from you as his child. My son, give me your what? Your heart. And now, the second thing you give is your service. Your service. Your service to the Lord. Your service to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 8, 5, he said, They gave themselves to the Lord and to us his servants by the will of God. So they were not only giving given to the Lord in salvation, but they were also given to the Lord in service with his servants. Are you listening, somebody? Job 36 verse 11 tells us, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. And the last thing you give is your resources. Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 9. Honor the Lord with your substance, with your possessions, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your vats shall overflow with new wine. Are you listening, somebody? Honor the Lord with your substance. Don't say, I've given you my heart. God is looking at also your substance. Why? Because where man's heart is, treasure is, there his heart also will be. Are you listening, somebody? So this is the time for you to 
should be reminded. And this is a time for you to understand that there's a law called the law of seed time and harvest. When you tap into that law, you have tapped into greatness. When you understand that law in every dimension of your life, you have discovered the things that will never fail as far as success and prosperity is concerned. What is it that you desire in abundance? Position yourself to release that in abundance to your world. Position yourself to release that in abundance to God. Position yourself to release that in abundance to others, and it shall be coming back to you in multiplied form in Jesus' name. Remember, your sowing does not add to you. It multiplies you. The, your sowing does not add to what you have sown. It is multiplied. Why? Because sowing is a gateway to multiplication, and it is the gateway to open heavens. Thank you so much for joining. It is always a joy, and I never want to come to the end of the but we have to. Thank you so much for being part of the service. Before I leave, I would like to encourage and to call upon someone that you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, and I want you to give you an opportunity to do that before we move. And this is the prayer you're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I accept Jesus Christ, your son, as my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I give you my heart. Come into my life and make me a new creature. I am born again. I am your child in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, call the number on the screen, 0773-322-281-0754-322-281-0773-322-281-0754-322-281. Someone will be there to pray with you and to also guide you on the way forward as far as your life is concerned. And also I want to encourage you that every one of us, it is the end of month, we have our Thanksgiving and we also have our, 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 our normal, our usual tithes and offerings. Be a covenant practitioner. Look at the numbers on the screen, 0773-322-281, 0754-322-281. Go ahead and give your tithe. Go ahead and give your offerings, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. If you're writing a check, you write it to Amazing FA Church, and you call the numbers on the screen. And if, you, I mean, if you're making a transfer, you also call those numbers, and you'll be assisted accordingly. I want to tell you, we know about the churches being open with a limit of 70. We still, like I said, we will communicate to you on the way forward. But as of now, we shall still be meeting here by the grace of God, and we know that your life cannot remain the same in Jesus' mighty name. This is our communication that we shall be communicating the time and the date in which we shall be starting our services as in our, our, our gatherings again. But as of now, we continue to meet here on our page and also on YouTube. May the Lord bless you richly and I can assure you God has great plans for you. And when we come back to the city, we shall be coming in greater power and the glory of God shall be seen in magnified form and the devil is in trouble because we are taking back whatever the Lord promised us for 2020 in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. I love you so much. See you again on Wednesday in Jesus' name. Amen.